Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classics of Philosophy. I'm your host, Gabriel Turner, and if you enjoy the contents of this podcast, or any other podcast for that matter, and want to continue to support the show, visit patron.podbean.com forward slash the Classics of Philosophy. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the show. Today, we are going to be diving into one of Aristotle's works, The De Anima. Now, in this podcast, we are going to be covering Book 1, as well as Chapters 1 through 3 of Book 2 of The De Anima, with future episodes covering the remainder of the treatise, as well as other treatises. In addition to this, I plan to have a future podcast detailing the account of Aristotle's life story. Now, before we get started, I wanted to briefly describe what I hope I can bring to you as an audience. I want to bring you on the journey of understanding these advanced philosophical texts, bringing their ideas and concepts into our everyday lives. I want to help expand both your knowledge and my own of these topics, which in turn I hope help define and solidify our own personal views. With this said, let's dive in. Something that we need to note, even before opening up Book 1, is that Aristotle believes that the soul uncontroversially exists, although as to how it exists in relation to bodies and the structure of it in general is up to discussion. Now he opens up Book 1 by stating that it is reasonable to regard the inquiry concerning the soul as of the first importance. Aristotle believes that it is this knowledge of the soul that is more beautiful and valuable than others, as it relates to what he calls higher and more wonderful things. He says that this inquiry seems to contribute to the whole body of truth in general, and in particular, the study of nature, as nature is preeminently comprised of bodies, which in turn seem to be associated with the soul in some way. He believes that this investigation into nature and the essence of soul, as well as its essential attributes, seem to be a good place to start. Now, of these attributes of the soul, some seem to be affections peculiar to the soul, and some seem to belong to living things also by virtue of the soul. But to attain any sure belief on the subject is difficult, due to the problems associated with it. He says that if we had one method to dissect such difficulties, then the problem would shrink. But if there is no one common method of finding the essential nature, our handling of the subject becomes still more difficult. It is here that he breaks down the investigation in the following way. Our first order of business is to determine to what category the soul belongs to, whether it be a substance, a quality, quantity, or to any one of our pre-established categories. Now this is referring to the ten categories developed in another treatise, which I hope to cover in future episodes, but just know that he has these pre-established categories that he believes everything should fit into, and it is our duty to find to which of these categories the soul should reside in. The second order of business, we must inquire whether it has parts and whether every soul is of the same kind. If not, what is the difference between species or genus? He notes that most of his predecessors often failed to account for soul existing apart from man. And so, if we are to stay away from this error, we must not confine ourselves to the soul of man. As far as the divisibility of the soul, Aristotle asks the question, if the soul has parts, should we inquire into the whole or the parts? Should we then inquire into the parts or their functions? and if their functions, then the objects corresponding to them? He acknowledges that knowledge of a thing's nature is valuable into the examination of the attributes, but the converse is also true. For when we are in a position to expound all or most of the attributes as presented to us, we shall also be best qualified to speak about essence. Now of the affections of the soul, we ask the question of whether they can exist apart from the body. Aristotle responds by saying that it appears that in most cases, none can, as in the case of anger, courage, and sensation generally, though possibly thinking is an exception. This idea of thinking being separable in some way will be a recurring idea as we continue to go through his material, and so keep that in mind as we continue. He goes on considering that if any function is peculiar to the soul, it can be separated from the body. Now who is to investigate such causes? Aristotle continues stating that the natural philosopher would give the material cause, and the logician would give the formal cause of the essence in our investigation. To depict this distinction clearly, we can take the example Aristotle provides us with. The formula of a house is a covering to protect from damage by wind, rain, and heat, whereas the material cause would be the stones, bricks, timbers, etc. He states that the preferred individual who would be inquiring as to the nature of the soul would consider both the material cause and the formal cause. In chapter 2, Aristotle asks us to consider previous views, stating that we must take with us for comparison the theories expounded by our predecessors. 
Now of these views, they seem to all be in consideration of the two qualities of the soul that were popular at the time, movement and sensation. It is through these qualities, as well as the idea of incorporality, that the predecessors argue for the existence of the soul. Now of those views, some give material causes such as fire, air, water, or a combination of them all. This idea stems from the phrase that like is known by like. The reasoning being that it appears that the human body, as well as other bodies, are comprised of the elements, and so the soul must be as well. Democritus, Leucippus, Empedocles, Thales, Diogenes, Heraclitus, Alcameon, Hippo, and Critias all seem to give materialistic accounts of the soul. Anaxagoras differs in his view that he distinguishes suke, the soul, and nous, mind, from the elements. Plato, on the other hand, gives a materialistic account in the Timaeus, but a formal account in the Periphilosophias. If you were interested in the previous accounts of the soul, I encourage you to read this section, but suffice it to say, Aristotle will continue in his effort to debunk the previous theories in favor of his own. Chapter 3 opens by discussing the investigation of movement, for he says that everything may be moved in two senses, directly and indirectly. We call movement indirect when a thing moves because it is in something which moves. For instance, the passengers on a ship, for they do not move in the same sense as the ship moves, for the ship moves directly, but they move only by being in something which moves. He notes that this analogy could hold true for the soul as well. Now of movement, we have four kinds, change of position, change of state, decay, and growth. If the soul moves, it must have one or more of these kinds of movement. If the soul has direct movement, then it must have position in space, as all movement takes place in space. Looking at the movement of the soul and body, it is reasonable to suppose that it moves the body in the same way that it itself moves. And so if the body moves by change in position, so does the soul. It is here that he begins to refute the idea that the soul moves its own body, saying that if this were possible, it would be possible for the soul to leave and re-enter a body, as in the resurrection of the dead, due to its ability to move in space. Similarly, he refutes this idea in Plato's view, with Plato's view being that the soul moves a body by its own movement, and more specifically that the soul is fashioned out of harmonic ratios, bent into the form of a circle, and in accordance with the heavenly bodies. Again, if you find this idea interesting, I encourage you to read this section, although the refutation of this idea, I believe, would take up a large portion of our time and is not directly important to the development of his own view. Chapter 4 depicts the various absurdities and impossibilities inherent in the harmony theory, the idea that the soul is a harmony. One of his points is that in this theory, there is no explanatory role for movement. Aristotle concludes that in no sense can harmony be reasonably identified with the soul. He summarizes this in Becker page 408a, line 79. It is clear from what has been said that the soul cannot be a harmony, nor can it revolve in a circle. It is, however, possible, as we have said, that it may be moved and even move itself incidentally but in no other sense can it move in space. Aristotle goes on referring to a sort of change of state of the soul, moving in the sense of growing angry, afraid, courageous, etc. Movements of this kind are caused by the soul, but to say that the soul gets angry is as if one were to say that the soul weaves or builds a house. This meaning that the soul is the instrument by which these things come to be. Furthering this idea, he states that movement does not take place in the soul but sometimes penetrates to it and sometimes starts from it. The example given is that perception of certain objects starts from the object in question and reaches towards the soul, whereas recollection starts from the soul and extends to movements in sense organs. It is at this point that he moves on to the perishability of the soul. He says that the power of thought and speculation decays alongside the body, but not because it itself is being affected, but that the body in which it resides is. He says that it is by this account that the soul cannot be moved. He ends the chapter with another refutation of Xenocrates' view of the soul as a self-moving number. Moving on to the final chapter of Book 1, Chapter 5 addresses the elemental theory as well as the division of the soul. Aristotle believes that he has effectively dispatched both the previous theories of the soul and is left to the elemental theory. His refutation of this argument lies in the respect of the phrase that like is affected by like. For who could seriously ask whether there is a stone or a man in the soul? In addition to this, there seems to be no way of denying souls to non-living objects. He goes on saying that even if we were to construct the soul out of elements, it would be unnecessary to construct it out of all of the elements, 
as only one pair is needed to discern like from opposite. From here, he creates a nice regress back into the question of the division of the soul into parts and their functions, asking whether knowing, perceiving, and the forming of opinions are operations of the soul besides desiring, wishing, and the appetites in general. And again, since movement in space is induced in living creatures by the soul, besides growth, maturity, and decay, do each of these belong to the soul as a whole? In addition to this, he asks about the function of these aspects of the soul and how the soul holds the body together. He makes use of an analogy to exemplify this question, stating that plants seem to live even when divided, as well as the insects, and that this implies that parts of the soul exist specifically the same, if not numerically, as that of the whole. At any rate, each of the two parts has sensation and moves in space for some time. He specifies that they do not continue to do so due to their lack of organs necessary to maintain their natural state. With this analogy in place, he ends chapter 5 and book 1 with the conclusion that the soul as a whole is divisible. Book 2 transitions more into Aristotle's development of his own view. Aristotle states that we can describe one class of existing things as substance. This class of existing things is again referring back to the ten categories he developed in another treatise. He further breaks down substance into three distinct categories, namely matter, which in itself is not an individual thing, shape or form, of which individuality is attributed, and the compound of the two, also known as a hylomorphic compound, a combination of both matter and form. To clarify this, the matter of some body is merely the constituents of that thing, for example, blood, bone, flesh, etc. The form, on the other hand, enables this matter to become informed, providing functionality and purpose for the matter. The combination of these two things becomes the hylomorphic compound, which make up any body or primary substance. He then goes on to state that matter is potentiality, while form is the realization or actuality of the two. It is at this point that Aristotle broadens the scope of his view, looking at the natural world around him and seeing that the world is comprised of bodies and most particularly natural bodies. This term natural bodies referring to those bodies of natural origin, which excludes man-made artifacts. Now of natural bodies, some have life and some have not. By life we mean the capacity for self-sustenance, growth, and decay. It is this internal arche of stability and motion that is necessary for life in Aristotle's eyes. The soul then is not associated with any body, but with a body of a specific kind, the kind that possesses life. The body then can be regarded as its own subject, i.e. the matter. It is at this point that he arrives at his first definition of the soul. The soul must be the substance, in the sense of form, of a natural body which potentially has life. With our previous knowledge of form being the realization or actualization of something, he redefines the definition of the soul and arrives at his second view. The soul is the actuality of a natural body which potentially has life. At this point, Aristotle begins to refine his definition further, although I see it best to introduce his analogy of the difference between first and second actualities, and the idea of potentiality, so that we can see the transition between his definitions. Aristotle asks us to consider bodies such as the eye and the axe. There are two kinds of actualities for these things. Actuality can be said to be both the capacity and the exercising of a given capacity, with potentiality being the matter. Returning to the analogy, the matter of the eye, the eye jelly if you will, can be referred to as the potentiality of the eye. The first actuality is the capacity of that matter, the capacity for vision. The second actuality of this matter would be the exercising of the capacity, in this case to be actively seeing. This analogy can be extended to the idea of an axe as well, which has the capacity to chop being the first actuality, and with the addition of the second actuality will be actively chopping. Aristotle thinks that this analogy can go even further, as it can also pertain to the soul, with the potentiality of the soul being that of a natural body, the matter, the soul being the first actuality, and to actively live as a certain kind respected to the soul being the second actuality. This analogy is summed up in the following passage. That which has the capacity to live is not the body which has lost its soul, but that which possesses soul. The soul is actuality in the same sense as the faculty of the eye for seeing. The body is that which exists potentially. When combined as a hylomorphic compound, the soul and the body make a living creature. It is this distinction that leads him to his third definition that the soul is the first actuality of a natural body which potentially has life. 
Before moving on, I think it is worth noting that the structure of this analogy is also in reference to the development of the four causes, which I hope to cover at a later date. It is at this point I believe Aristotle recognizes that in his attempt to define life and the soul, he has included the term life and aims to clear this up. He recognizes that of bodies that have life, the bodies are comprised of certain organs that perform various functions. This clarification leads him to his final definition of the soul, that soul is the first actuality of a natural organic body. Looking back at this chapter from a bird's eye view, we can see that in the first chapter alone, it seems that Aristotle has done what he came to do, find a generalized definition of the soul. But he believes his job is not yet done. He ends this chapter by stating that it is still not quite clear if the soul has certain parts and whether or not it is separable from the body. Chapter 2 begins with Aristotle assuming a fresh starting point for our inquiry, stating that soul is distinguished from that which has not by living. He notes that we say a thing lives if any one of the following are present in it, mind, sensation, movement in space, and nutrition. It is clear that Aristotle believes that all plants are alive as well, for they evidently have in themselves a capacity and first principle by means of which they exhibit growth and decay in opposite directions. He goes on saying that this faculty or capacity to absorb food may exist apart from all other faculty, but others cannot exist apart from this in mortal beings. Plants have no other capacity for the soul other than that which we have just mentioned, whereas animals have the first characteristic of sensation. Now of sensation, the essential factor is touch, meaning that touch may exist apart from all other senses, just as the nutritive faculty may exist apart from the sensitive faculty. Aristotle goes on saying that the soul is the origin of the characteristic of the faculties of nutrition, sensation, and thought. What he means by this is that it is through the soul that the characteristics of each of these faculties are able to come to fruition. Now the question remains as to whether or not these are separable in thought or space. He uses an analogy of the division of plants, saying that plants clearly live when divided or separated, and so the soul in them appears to be one in actuality in each whole plant, but potentially more than one. And similarly, this phenomenon exists in insects, for each of these parts has sensation and movement in space, and if sensation, then also imagination and appetite. But in the case of mind and the thinking faculty, nothing is yet clear. It seems to be a distinct kind of soul, and it alone emits of being separated as the immortal from the perishable. This idea being the one that we first encountered in book one of the text, and it is this quote that I just read that seems to endorse the view that the other faculties of the soul cannot be divorced from the body, except by definition. The soul is the actuality of some body, and for this reason the soul cannot exist without the body, but it itself is not a body. It is, however, always associated with a body of a particular kind, naturally inherent in its potentiality, this meaning that the soul of each body is unique to the type of body it is, to the class to which it belongs. The soul is the actuality of that which has a capacity for having a soul, i.e. a natural organic body. It is at this point that we leave chapter 2 and move on to chapter 3. Those faculties that we have mentioned thus far are nourishment, appetite, sensation, movement in space, and thought. Aristotle states that if for sensation, then also for appetite, for appetite consists of desire, inclination, and wish. From this and what we have gathered thus far, it seems clear that there are three main faculties of the soul, with others being associated with those faculties. These are nourishment, sensation, which is associated with appetite and imagination, and thought, or the rational faculty. Likewise, it seems that there is a hierarchy of the faculties of the soul involved, with the rational faculty at the top and the nutriment faculty at the bottom. Although all are dependent upon the lesser faculty, for without the nutritive soul, the faculty for the sensitive does not exist. But the nutritive soul can be divorced from the faculty of sensation. And similarly with touch, none of the other senses can exist. He further asserts this hierarchical structure saying that man and any other being similar or superior to him have the power of thinking and intelligence. This power of thinking and intelligence exists most rarely. If the creature has this faculty, then they have all the other powers as well. Of the faculties and the aspects of these faculties mentioned, locomotion seems to be one aspect that branches several faculties. For some plants are capable of locomotion as are animals. He ends the chapter noting that there must be a single definition of the soul, but it would be descriptive of no particular figure, nor the kinds of soul we have mentioned, and so we must then inquire into each several case, i.e., what is the soul of each individual, the plant, the beast, and the man? And why are they arranged in a series? This seems somewhat counterintuitive due to the time spent in chapter 1 developing generalized definition of the soul, 
but I believe Aristotle is endorsing the view that it would be more useful for us to have a specific definition of each individual, although the generalized definition is still useful in the sense of understanding what the soul is in a more broad sense. This groundwork that has been laid paves the way for future chapters to come, where we will discuss the nutritive and sensitive faculties of the soul in more detail. I want to thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and as always, if you have further questions about specific sentences in the reading that confused you or gave you a brilliant idea, I would love to hear from you. You can reach me via email at theclassicsofphilosophy at gmail.com, which can also be seen on my landing page at theclassicsofphilosophy.podbean.com. Thank you all for listening and joining my journey inquiring about life, customs, and things good and evil. I'll catch you on the next one.